the meeting. It's, it's live already? So I didn't have to copy paste anything, Emily. And I'm closing Facebook. I'm closing Firefox now. Okay. You're getting better at this, John. Who said that? Julie. Yeah. <laughs> You're improving. Don't, yeah, don't, don't preempt disaster. You know? Um, hey, so here we are. It's, um, it's our 16th show. Is that right, Emily? It's our 16th show. We've only um, omitted two shows since um, September 27th. Our first show is with Ann Waldman. Um, so it's very exciting this week to be down here in North Carolina with the Nomadic Institute for Cultural Activism International. And we have uh, this amazing opportunity to be with, with Alan today. Alan Moore is in Madrid. Uh, so welcome everyone from, from the live community, also on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, I just wanna start off by saying I'm a little intimidated by the lack of time that really uh, this experience with Alan demands. Um, and so perhaps uh, those of us who know Alan, this is a sort of way of catching up a little bit with recent work and uh, current conditions in Madrid um, and other places that he may be sort of in touch with. Um, also wanna say that my, my stepsister is here Colleen Fitzgibbon and her husband, Tom. And, you know, I always felt, um, oh, there's Vera Dickman coming in from Paris. Anyway, I went to high school with Colleen and she was about four years older than me. And I always felt like she was the adult in the room, you know? And so I still kind of feel that way, Colleen. And, and you know, just to be here with you guys, um, although we've all had pretty robust careers and life experiences, I still look up to you guys as, uh, you know, my mentors. So thank you for, uh, for being with us, uh, everyone. And I'm gonna start off with a, a quote from, I believe a colleague of Alan's, uh, Gregory Cholette. Is that right, Alan? Yeah, Cholette. And, yeah, and um, here's what, what, um, what Gregory Cholette had to say. Um, this is uh, from an imaginary interview with Gregory Chollette regarding the uncanny political and cultural activities of 2018, two years after Brexit and Trump. There are a couple of questions in my mind. Where does this new reality leave dark matter, including us barricade builders, museum boycotters, and barricade busters? Where does it leave those of us who construct mock institutional identities to slip between the interstitial spaces of an om omnivorous culture industry. But also those of us attempting to paradoxically support social practice art while preventing it from becoming just another academic field. Um, as Emily and I imagined, uh, occupying sort of virtual real estate with the rubric in international, what is it called? Oh yeah, the Institute. Yeah, boldly and, and sort of uh, uh, presumptuously and, and um, what's the other word? Uh, grandiosity, the grandiosity of calling this an Institute, the Institute for Cultural Activism. Um, you know, in a way it's perhaps a kind of uh, virtual occupation of a name, of a concept, to attribute institutional um, uh, value to cultural activism. Um, it's our invitation, of course, for an international conversation and some kind of coordination uh, of activities, perhaps, that uh, there is that potential. Um, so um, around 1974, Alan, Buckminster Fuller, speaking at Hunter College in New York, said that were food evenly distributed around the world, there would be no starvation. 
So this would obviously have meant that at the time there must have been uh, actual waste and disposal of food in some places and starvation in others. A few years ago in 2014, I interviewed the scientist and monk, Mathieu Ricard, speaking with me in Montreal on camera for the Waking Buddha Project. Uh, Matthew said that the exploitation of natural resources combined with population explosion would, by 2050, 2050, require us to have two more planets for our civilization to continue. So um, a question, Alan, and this is a sort of really quick yes and no question, I think. We'll come back to the, the context later. Um, at this present time, if our values and economic systems were different, would there be enough housing for all the homeless and political and climate refugees in the world? Climate refugees, about 65 million. Um, so maybe a yes or a no, or we'll come back to that later. Um, Liz Flint is here, by the way, who earlier said that, Alan, you're, you're one of her, uh, hey, there she is, Liz Flint, one of her heroes. Alan, so, um, so yeah, there's a question on the table, Alan, and, um, and perhaps what, in ca what impact can we have uh, in, in these um, conditions of uh, homelessness, et cetera? So we have a, a lot to go through. And Alan, there, there's a first question for you, if you don't mind. Yes. Okay, the answer is yes to the question, that we would have enough space it were things, um, were values different and systems different for there to be no homeless? Of course. Okay. So why don't you begin your screen share, Alan, and um, we're going to table questions up uh, until 5.08 or about 5.05 .05 or so, uh, during which time Alan and I have a kind of exclusive opportunity to, to explore um, his work and research for, for all of us. Uh, after which we can all ask questions or make comments. So thanks thanks again. I, I see we have um, quite, quite an array of, of people here from different parts of the world. Um, that, that's the idea of the tuning fork, to occupy, occupy this space together with the sort of intention that something can come out, that there would be some outcome, some positive movement or energy or perhaps even a concrete plan after such meetings. Thank you. There you go, Alan. Okay. If well, you need coaching, let Emily coach you if you need any technical help. Oh, okay. Well, um, sorry, but this is going to be uh, kind of a conventional artist talk. Um, I wrote a memoir and uh, it's off to the copy editor. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about my stuff. So uh, let's see if I can manage this to happen. Can you see that? Good. Perfect, Alan. This is uh, me actually not so callow, but looking pretty callow um, in my little hat and woolen vest. Um, okay, no. There we go. Where, where would that be, Alan? This was at ABC No Rio. The caption says, uh, this Tom Warren did a show called The Portrait Show in 1981 uh, as our place was getting started. And um, this is his picture of me. Yeah. Um, so basically I'm starting my memoir, which is a year, my years in New York um, with my uh, arrival in 1974 as an intern for Art Forum. Um, and uh, they fired me and I went to ArtWrite, which was a hell of a lot more fun. Um, so I began as a critic with a kind of overview of lower Manhattan uh, activity. And uh, I quickly fell into a, a group called Colab and um, that formed up in the late seventies and um, a lot of the memoirs about that, not too much. Um, Alan, and, just, um, if you don't mind, for those who are not uh, aware, can you do a, a quick shout out to some of the collab people who are here? Oh, well, there's uh, Colleen and Tom and Bobby G and Julie Harrison. Um, yeah, I think that that was as many as I saw coming in. Um, 
Yeah. So anyway, so that was the group that formed and uh, they did a lot of things. And uh, the big thing that I was involved with was this real estate show in 1980. And uh, John Halpern, you, you also were running alongside uh, that with your own activities. Uh, anyhow, um, we were uh, honored by the presence of Joseph Boyce at our press conference. And as a result, the city in the time, New York Times coverage, this guy, Josh Barbanel, who wrote this article later became editor of the Times. So he was... Uh, even then a, a tiny heavyweight. Um, so we got um, this is a photo that Ann Messner took, which was kind of classic, like we could be in Syria, right? Um, we, got, uh, we got a storefront, uh, uh, ABC No Rio, uh, and a kind of a alternative institution was formed, which uh, exists uh, to this day. Um, so the next big kick that uh, Colab did, and probably, the apogee of its influence in the New York art world was the Times Square show in 1980 in the summer of that same year. Um, and uh, this was a big bang and uh, a lot of artists uh, participated and a lot of artists got over. So the outcome of this was kind of, yeah, this is, uh, we did TV ads, which was kind of an um, aspect of Colab that it was a multimedia organization uh, began really with filmmakers and um, the exhibition part of it, real estate show, Times Square show had strong media components. Um, so the outcome of that was um, a benefit exhibition and uh, we had a opportunity to exhibit the new museum and apparently that was, that was we ditched it. Um, this was after the Times Square show and I concentrated a lot in researches on that when I was in New York in the fall of 19. And it turns out that according to Marsha Tucker, they had a problem with Colab because they did this show. Yeah, with a commercial gallery. So anyhow, that, that was a curious thing, but who knows, it's all dirty laundry of the past. In, so, any so in, other, in other words, the idea was that if you had been uh, involved with a commercial venue that the new museum would not have been, or no? Uh, they, this is not what they said. They said that we pulled out because we thought it would advantage the new museum more than it would advantage us. This is a contention that was repeated a number of times. It was a key turning point for Colab because that was our opportunity to work with New York City's institutional structure and actually nationally their institutional structure. and. Uh, we decided not to do it. So we continued on an autonomous path. This is what I've been thinking about a lot um, is the question of autonomy um, as there have uh, emerged a number of autonomous organizations with strong uh, kind of lasting power now in the last several years uh, around archives, but that's another question. So anyway, I'll just roar through this. Um, so I worked for the East Village Eye as a laborer, as a typesetter. But so I was in the office all the time when stuff was going down, although I wasn't editing and writing very much at all. Um, so I kind of had a ringside seat for a lot of stuff that went on at the Lower East Side uh, after and as a result of Colab's actions. And uh, um, anyway, yeah. Alan, what, what would you say would the, the dates would be for the East Village Eye in terms of start and stop? 79 to 87. Okay, and how long were you with them? The whole time. Uh-huh, and- um, I don't think for the first issue, but I walked into their office and I knew how to work their machine and yeah. they were overjoyed. Oh yeah, and Lex, uh, was it Les, uh, Rexelbaum was one uh, of the writers? Les was the writer for them. He wrote for a lot of community newspapers. There was a whole network of community news, newspapers around New York during those years. Um, Including mean, the Soho News. Right, well, there were a lot more of them. Uh, they yeah. were neighborhood based, usually run by a rich guy who wanted to have some political influence. This whole print culture is all, it's ancient history, doesn't exist. Right. I mean, if you look back a hundred years ago, New York had like 30 or 40 newspapers in you know 10 or 15 different languages. So anyway. Um, so, yeah, so I was involved with ABC Norio and in the memoir, I write a lot about what was happening in the, 
uh, the East Village uh, art movement and so uh, East Village gallery <laughs> art movement. Um, and I got involved then in 1986 with the uh, video distribution project called the MWF Video Club. And uh, this has sort of ended up to be uh, um, a strangely endless uh, kind of project. Although VHS as a medium of distribution sunsetted uh, around the turn of the century, um, a lot of the material has been preserved and is online at the archive.org, uh, MWF Video Club collection that was in our- Were you our, a producer, Alan? Did you produce pardon? material? Did you also produce material there? Yeah, yeah. I, I was a producer for Potato Wolf. And um, yeah, so some of my productions were in distribution. That was a, a vehicle for basically distributing collab productions. That was the principal idea. And then a lot of other artists came in and we distributed their work as well. Uh, um, Alan, if you don't mind, I just want to take a, 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 a con contemplative break for a moment. Um, also to recognize um, Babette, who's here from Holland, and uh, may have something to also comment later about the, the, the um, squatting in, in Holland, I think they called it cracking. Is that right, Alan? Yeah, cracking. Crack, yep. Yeah. And um, I think in this, at this time when you were uh, doing this work, I think Babette was in the San Francisco at the Art Institute, uh, or, you know, um, I believe that's, that's correct. Anyway, um, the contemplative moment is just that uh, we'd like to dedicate this show, Emily and I, to our friends, Monet Clark, who was on the show a few months ago, who's um, in a very radical state of uh, immune, um, what is that thing that this is, this immune deficiency thing that uh, people get CPRS, that kind of thing. And also uh, Tara Subkoff, a performance artist, has COVID. So we're hoping everyone pulls through soon and, uh, and, and thrives once more. Um, that's it, Alan, sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Sure, no. Um, yeah, I just learned about another syndrome that's afflicting mainly African-Americans called the uh, Kawasaki. Uh, really? Which is, yeah, related to COVID, it's not clear. Um, oh. Anyway, uh, you tell more about that afterwards. Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, yeah. Just uh, I was listening to the Maroon podcast, anarchist podcast, and the woman said, the police going to come and kill us like Kawasaki. I thought, what? What? What's that? And it turns out it's a syndrome that's associated with COVID. And it's hard to diagnose because it's skin eruptions. And um, anyway, yeah. So. Oh. Okay. Anyway, so to return to the, the thread here, um, yeah, uh, a number of these, uh, these uh, videos from the MWF Video Club collection, which was at the end of the project, was about 600 boxes, 600 tapes in uh, dozens and dozens of boxes in all different analog formats, videotapes. Um, and the Preservation of this material began with an exhibition at the new museum called the Exfer Station or Transfer Station, which led to the formation of a collective of moving image archivists. Um, so distribution of the collab videos sort of ended up being this long-term archival project, which is ongoing. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's also uh, in 2012, I think it was, um, Hunter College did an exhibition on the Times Square show. This is a wonderful website with many reminiscences by uh, individual uh, artists who participated. Um, Shauna Hunter, no, Shauna Cooper did a wonderful job on that show. Um, and the website continues to exist, unlike the websites for most art exhibitions. Um, and in 2014, uh, we sort of, a bunch of us, a bunch of institutions self-organized uh, real estate show revisited exhibition, James Fuentes Commercial Gallery um, showed that as well. Uh, John showed a couple of videos from that show before we started. And I produced um, this issue of House Magic, which was a zine I was making at the time uh, about the real estate show and our 
occupation or you know 12 hour squat of um, a building uh, which then resulted in a in a relocation by the the city to ABC in Rio. Um, so um, as my time in New York came to an end, um, I moved to Europe and I started working on um, squatting as a researcher. I had an academic career that was fairly short and um, very uh, nomadic. And um, with the downturn in 2008, the public institutions were decimated and I couldn't really get any more jobs. So I went to Europe to research squatting. And um, that's when I produced the uh, House Magic Zine. It began as a research exhibition at the Sculpture Center in ABC No Rio. And it um, just kind of the zine continued. So, uh, Alan, excuse me, which, which year was it that you sort of migrated to, to Europe? Well, I started going in 2006. Okay. And um, uh, I really started working hard in 2009. Um, so this is the Berlin cover of the Berlin issue. Um, so the reason I was able to do this was because I joined a research group called the Squatting Europe Collective. It was organized by a guy in, uh, in uh, Madrid who I met, who was a sociologist uh, and um, a bunch of other people, uh, other sociologists and, and junior academics and activists, uh, squatters uh, joined this research group. Here we are in Barcelona in 2015, which is kind of our high watermark. Uh, Miguel uh, arranged for a big grant, him and Hans, and uh, we had a wonderful conference. Um, so 2015, I, I wrote a book, uh, Occupation Culture, which was about my researches with the, squ the Squake Group. And it's sort of like a kind of memoir, but it's still, it's not um, a totally personal book as the memoir I've just written, but um, it's, it's basically my adventures with the Squatting Europe Group. Um, and another kind of major source of information about what we were up to um, and uh, what was happening all around us in the lower Manhattan in the late 20th century uh, is um, kind of constantly being accreted by Mark Miller on his website, 98bowery.com. Um, and he took a book that we made together in 1985, which was a catalog of um, the ABC No Rio space and uh, put it online. So that's more accessible than the book by far. And he continues to make like little shows because he has a business of selling ephemera, um, which uh, I initially supplied him with piles of stuff to sell. So last year, uh, my mother died and um, I uh, was uh, there in the house in Milwaukee where they, uh, my family had been collecting for, um, many years artworks um, and I, I decided uh, after she passed away in August to do a show in the house uh, of the collection that we had assembled uh, over 30 odd years and um, so I, I did that here's uh, I got a couple of curators because um, you know when you sell a house you get a bunch of money right that was gonna happen. So uh, I got a couple of curators to actually prepare this show, prepare the artworks, pack them down, um, you know, a whole pro job, uh, which is ridiculously expensive as some of us are hey, well Ellen, aware. I, want to, I want to say hi to Becky Howland, who, who said uh, it's a great Bobby G painting. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, no, that's Becky. a classic. It's a, a real killer. Um, so there's Kimberly and the cat. Uh, the so cat had to go. What were the dates shedding. of the show? Sorry? What were the dates of the show in Milwaukee? Um, it happened in September and October, but like about three people came. You know, I, I apologize because Emily and I were traveling back. Uh, yeah, uh, that's true. The north side of Lake Michigan. Um, and the timing was just like two days off. And we apologize oh, yeah. for not having crashed no, on your floor. Of course, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. Uh, the COVID was hitting, people were freaking out. Anyway, so, I mean, I did it. 
And it was about kind of preparing the collection and uh, ordering it and preserving it and matting tons of stuff. And, you know, that was kind of where it was. Anyway, so um, I'm writing this memoir and there's a hell of a lot of it. In fact, there's four books, I'm publishing three. And the fourth book just kind of started sprawling out of control and I can't use it, so I'm blogging it. Um, so on my blog, Art Gangs, over the course of the next, this year, uh, there will appear periodic uh, chunks of, of research material from this project. Um, yeah, so basically... Uh, so hey, Ellen, just in yeah. terms of Art Gangs, is there a context that um, sort of, you know, captures what the Art Gangs refers to or is contextualized by? Um, does, is it related to squatting as well or activism? No, um, Art Gangs, uh, basically, I stole the title from my mother's work, which was, uh, she was a sociologist uh, studying gangs, Chicano gangs in Los Angeles in particular, uh, male and female. And um, it was the title of a book that uh, was my doctoral dissertation. Uh, that was published by Autonomy Media in 2012, I think, yeah. Um, and it is a, a series of uh, a kind of a, a historical progression first outlined by Lucy Lepard of artist groups, beginning with the Art Workers Coalition, going through SOHO, um, Artists Meeting for Cultural Change, collab, group material, uh, political art documentation distribution, that whole series of groups from 69 to 84. Uh, yeah, and I was looking at that as a, a kind of a rise of uh, political um, focus in the art world in New York, which was kind of new. It came out from below with the Art Workers Coalition surfaced uh, generally and included a lot of important people and went forward from that. So, so the blog- The years, the years that you're just referencing? Uh, 1969 to 1984 was the period that I looked at. Yeah. Um, and that, it's basically from the Art Workers Coalition's um, formation against the Museum of Modern Art with the Takis withdrawing his piece through Group Materials Americana show at the Whitney Museum. Great, great. Thanks. So this, this uh, blog, Art Gangs, is where I put uh, my work on, on art-related uh, matters. I have another blog, Occupation, Cult Occupations and Properties, which is involved with squatting. It's kind of dormant now because I've been working on this other stuff. But that's, that's kind of it. That's where I am. I'm knee deep in uh, old stuff, archives, and uh, I dream about all my old friends. <laughs> <laughs> and enemies. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, I realized, you know, um, and here's where we go into the Buddhistic uh, philosophical thing that this is all uh, this kind of pharaonic uh, construction of, uh, of uh, it's tomb building behavior is what it is. And it, it makes me very uneasy uh, to be engaged in that, but it has an inertia of its own and it goes forward and it's, uh, I can't escape it. Uh, it doesn't, it's not that demanding. I mean, recently it has been because of the book, but uh, um, you know, I just ended up, cause I save stuff and I bought stuff and I end up with masses of stuff, masses of material from my passage through time, um, listing it, storing it, I have to, I have to take responsibility for it. And uh, I, I desperately desire to be rid of it all. Alan, um, you mentioned something in, in, as a, in a philosophic context. I'm not quite clear what the, you know, sort of theme is or concept is that you're sharing. Oh, well, you know, uh, when I lived in Staten Island, there was a Buddhist up the street, an actor named Jonathan and it was the time when the Taliban destroyed the Bamiyan uh, Buddhas, you know, the enormous, and they broadcast the destruction. I said, damn, 
that must have hit you in the gut. You're a Buddhist. And he said, everything goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, the, the bombing on Buddhas were destroyed about a year before 9-11 occurred. And there was this very strange, iconic parallel between those two giant Buddhas and the two twin towers. Yeah. Uh, I tried to discuss that idea with the Dalai Lama, but I, I couldn't I couldn't convey it to him clearly enough. So it just kind of got lost on the floor of the editing room, you know. <laughs> um, I have a photograph also from from the uh, the real estate, you know, the first event on Delancey Street. That's that's kind of nice to see that in the Soho News. Um, uh, I could share it in case people are interested in seeing a little bit more of that of that um, of that moment. Uh, I don't know what you can see here. Um, well, I'll come back to it later. But as as a matter of fact, it was fun because I I called up um, Ron Feldman. And we were in the middle of shooting the the movie about boys at the Guggenheim. And I called up Feldman and said, hey, Ron, I think it would be a good idea if you brought Joseph over to Delancey Street so you know we could all be there together. And um, it was just a real joy to revisit this, uh, thanks to all of you at, at the Fuentes Gallery you know, a few years ago. And I, I, do, I do have some really nice videography that I did with Colleen. And someone else was also filming. I can't recall who that was. Um, who did you say it was, Alan? Oh, um, Julie Martin was involved with that. Oh, Julie Martin. So between Julie and I, we have uh, a whole collection of wonderful interviews um, about the event uh, at, shot at the gallery. Um, anyway. Yeah, well, I, I would say that, you know, in my research is looking over um, a lot of different things, especially things that are online. Um, the uh, Hunter College Times Square show revisited um, stands out as a really good resource. And it's basically just interviews with people who participated. And um, I think those are always golden. People really like to hear that. And it tells a lot, it tells a lot about what went on and how people felt about it. And that's accessible, Alan? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's Hunter College Times Square show revisited. You could look it up, but um, I think- On Online. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why, you know, I'm interested in transcripts of these uh, interview videos, uh, because I think, I think they could be uh, a good uh, resource, a good book. Okay, so anyway- I, I feel I think... uneasy now even saying book, you know, because- Yeah, it's frightening. Well, avalanche of work, right? Uh, no, you know, it's manageable, but it's just, it exists in this kind of very strange liminal space now. I mean, Printed Matters uh, virtual art book fair is just about to open in a week, but it's already, you can go and see the tables of the different publishers. And uh, uh, I, it, it's really weird to see these extremely material books attempting to represent these things on online. <laughs> you can't touch them and they're like, you know, fine Japanese paper and whatnot. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know. Yeah. Alan, who's publishing uh, your memoir? Me. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I've had no luck uh, uh, trying to get things published by normal people. Uh, only freaks publish my shit, and um, this is not freaky enough for them. So I got to do it myself. So, Alan, um, I mean that again is like it doesn't even matter anymore. Um, for me to have it, to have it out there for the people that would like to have it, um, that's it. I mean, uh, there's no um, for me no. Uh, benefit, reputational, monetary, mm -hmm. uh, in having uh, a commercial publisher or even a non-commercial independent publisher work over my shit 
for a year or so before they decide to release it or not. <laughs> um, you know, how is it going to be distributed? Uh, Journal of Aesthetics and Protests will oh, distribute, good. so they'll fulfill. Yeah. Uh huh. Great. So. Uh, eventually, Emily and I will be able to um, include Alan's work on our website, the Institute for Cultural Activism, and um, if Alan allows us to do that, and uh, that'll be part of our, our archive and, and scholarship on the topic of cultural activism. Well, um, everything, everything I've done insofar as I've been able to so far release it publicly is publicly available online, except for art gangs, which is still in a print book. Mm. Mm -hmm. Alan, did I understand correctly that you are um, looking into cracking or squatting uh, internationally, globally at this point too? Well, I, I have a couple more uh, research book projects I'd like to do uh, in the zone of squatting. I think that uh, a, uh, a big golden book of European squatted social centers would be really useful to inspire people because there've been some incredible projects that have taken place over the last 30, 40 years in Europe, uh, all of them gone almost, I think. Well, uh, for example, Copenhagen, is that still active? Christiania, yeah, no, no, that's the most famous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, many of them exist, and several of them have been converted into uh, conventional institutions, uh, Shedhala in Zurich, and uh, right, yeah. So uh, a number of them, and um, Gengaviertel in Hamburg uh, is still autonomous, but um, yeah, but most of them are gone. Uh, so just to kind of remember them and uh, to present them uh, in one book, I think would be a useful, a useful project. Also to look at uh, squatting in uh, South America, uh, which, you know, is a much more complex question because of uh, the uh, long-term uh, occupation by indigenous people of their lands. So it's a, it's kind of a different kettle of fish, but there's never been anything published on that that I've seen. I'm sorry to jump in, but I, I need to get back. I'm a friend of uh, John's. Uh, my name's Tony Stern. And I have to get back to the homeless shelter where I work, uh, the work thereof. Um, and so if I could jump in just with a, a question and comment or two. Um, it seems like the word remembering is a big, big part of what's going on here. Uh, and perhaps the universe remembers through our individual and collective remembering. Um, but it does seem like there's a kind of question, at least for me, which preceded this particular um, beautiful presentation, which has to do with uh, what's the relationship between old and new, uh, between the old and the new, and does the old become the new? What what? Uh, and archive, archiving, and what do we, the, the, the whole, the whole, what do we do with everything that's gone that has value is a major question, I think, for all of us. It is for me, which is why I'm a semi hoarder myself. Uh, and so, um, one of the things I'll just mention is I'm, I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot and Four Quartet saying, and each moment is a radical valuation of all that has been, which for me is a partial answer in a very un-Zen uh, style, but a very Zen content uh, in terms of that each moment is a radical re-envisioning of all that has been. And, and where do we stand in relation to that? And how and where might we stand? And it seems to me that you're standing in a very interesting and very rich place, which joins with my question, what's the relation between old and new? And what do we try to preserve? And what do we just let go of? How much do we let go? How much do we hold on? Is there some narrow ridge or fine line between the two? All yours. Well, it's a um, pretty irresolvable question. Um, yeah. I, I like your Eliot quote. I mean, 
Um, I'm sure Dee Dee Halleck would have something to say about this <laughs> since she's been involved in the, the very ephemeral, fragile medium of video for her whole life. <laughs> And has probably well, we're we're all in, a we're lot more tapes than the MWF Video Club. By the okay. way, we're all in the 3D video that is quite ephemeral. Yeah, whether yeah. we're videographers or not, and so I think we all have a taste of it. Yeah, no, I mean it. You know, constantly as as I go over this stuff, as I say, print culture in New York, uh, uh, periodical <laughs> print culture is over with. Um, uh, artists, cable television, uh, video distribution and VHS, uh, all of this stuff, even, even house shows, uh, punk shows, it's all over. Um, you know, all the formal concerns that animated the art forum uh, sect in uh, the mid seventies, it's over. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's always the new. Uh, so what, does your old contribute to the new? I mean, well, in a sense, for me, it, uh, I understand a kind of a political continuum going into social practice art, which is sort of the becoming politics of art, uh, of artistic production, which is, uh, I understand it as a, as a sort of a teleological development, um, you know, and I, I, I hope that I shoveled some uh, uh, coal into that fire. Nice. I, I'd like to recommend this book that is by um, Nandini Bangji. <clears throat> I don't know if Can you put it more in front. I, we don't see it. We don't see it. There we go. Yeah, but it's backwards. So you have oh, to. Okay. The counter institution. But it's, uh, it's a brilliant book. Counter institution art activist estates on the Lower East Side. And uh, gives a, a interesting uh, overview of uh, all the, how important the, to have a space. And I'd like to ask Alan what's happening with the ABC No Rio space. Um, well, hopefully construction will start uh, soon. The money's there. Uh, the permissions are are rolling forward. Um, apparently, they have fast tracked it. But fast tracked it is fast tracked is brontosaurus slow in New York City yeah. for uh, city construction projects. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I really don't know what to how to I answer wanted, that. I, I wanted to um, reply also to Tony's question and comment. It's a, a vast uh, topic, old and new. But um, in terms of uh, yogurt, you know, you take some culture from the past and you create a new yogurt uh, that can be used in the future. <laughs> and um, perhaps that's kind of uh, mm. the way the baton is handed mm. down through culture, Tony. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, nice. a, it's a very complex uh, kind of area to get into, but um, I think in part mm -hmm. what Emily and I are trying to do as well is to create a living archive uh, on the website, for example, that um, can be referenced as a catapult and a leverage for people to work in the cultural space that Alan is defining as social practice art. Um, this is, in our opinion, the age of cultural activism. And I hear it even echoed in the words of uh, the new President Biden. Um, very interesting stuff that's going on in the uh, socio-political cultural space that we in a way are not only the caretakers of but I think we um, you know as a, as a community uh, have an opportunity to really intervene um, which is you know hopefully the, the privilege of this of these gatherings. Um, more Irish poetry for sure more Irish poetry with Joe Biden around. <laughs> um, I wanted to to continue to ask Alan some questions up, up until about uh, 5.05, .05, if you don't mind. And um, I wanted to ask Alan that when you began this work, and you, you've, you've mentioned your, your mother, Alan, and her work. So uh, apparently there's some migration of sensibilities and values um, that, that you seem to have sort of um, 
inherited, so to speak. Um, yeah, no, I, I just imitated my parents. Um, my dad was involved in the margins of the Hollywood film industry. And so of course I had to make films and then he got into distribution. And of course I had to distribute. Uh, and my mother was a sociologist. So of course I had to turn art history into sociology. So, yeah. Well, when you um, first began this, this kind of work, this sociological cultural digging that you do, uh, were you aware that you were tackling like one of the most imminent crises in the world uh, that was to become um, such a massive issue? What, you mean climate change? Housing, housing issues, uh, occupation, uh, <laughs> the, you know, reappropriation or appropriation of abandoned or- um, I did go to Earth Day in Scranton in 71. Say it again? I went to Earth Day in Scranton, Pennsylvania in 71. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, that, that's it. I mean, that's, you know, that's what's up, right? Right. For all of us. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you said, can everybody be housed? Of course, but you know, um, the resistance is, is going to be uh, fierce. Uh, the whole structure of laws against it and the structure of law that is against it is being reinforced. Um, the, uh, the part of, of law that uh, uh, is more permissive and that is more expandable seems to be contracting. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, David Harvey points it out that what, uh, pe what people make rent, what people make money out of now is the extraction of rents and um, you know, cloud computing uh, I have to pay Google now, even though Google doesn't show me my early, earlier emails that two weeks ago, they have 72,000 of them. And in order to keep them and keep the blog running, I have to pay them rent now. And yeah, I mean, that's sort of how it's rolling forward is we're gonna all have to pay rent on immaterial space. Uh, so being unhoused, I mean, I, I just listened to battles uh, uh, by the uh, in, indigenous uh, anarchists in um, North Dakota uh, for the unhoused who uh, have to suffer 30 degree below zero uh, winter weather there. Uh, and I thought it was very cool that uh, this uh, Native American activist referred to them as the relatives, our relatives who are right. living outside. It was very sweet. And. Uh, oh. We were just yeah. talking last night about the fact that uh, the elders um, have prioritized uh, their receiving the COVID vaccine first so that they can preserve their language. Um, so the older people who still hold to the old languages and still have them will be um, the ones who are given the first, the first dose of vaccines. Uh, so that's also about culture um, rolling forward, isn't it? Um, Very important. Isn't it not? Is it not inevitable that we're going to have to tackle the the homeless issue uh, with with a whole other perspective? Is that not inevitable? Um, <laughs> I guess. I I mean, she was. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to be naive because I I I, I do consider myself really ignorant about so many of these vast issues and forces at work, but it seems as though we're really, we're getting to the end and uh, there have to be some radical transitions, which perhaps, you know, cultural activism ushers um, into society, but it seems as though we have to do this. It's not, you know, as the Dalai Lama said recently, it's not about individual happiness any longer, it's about the collective happiness of all, you know, the, the, the big human family. Um, and obviously uh, the uh, preservation of, of the mother earth um, and his resources. So I, I um, perhaps I just, uh, you know, have a, a naive, uh, you know, sort of um, um, 
hopelessly optimistic attitude about these things, but it seems as though it's a choiceless, it's a choiceless reality. Otherwise we're facing social self-destruction. Um, I mean, all the people that came out voting for Trump and who believe there was a, you know, a, a, a false election. Um, I highly recommend the article in The Guardian today by Igor Vamos, uh, known as the yet yeah, one of the yes men. Um, the, it's about the selling of weapons on the internet, but it goes beyond that. If you read all the way to the end of the article, which is quite long. That's great, Dee. Uh, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant piece. I, it, it's, it's the most important piece I've read in the last three months. It's just really well worth looking at and going all the way to the end because uh, I think it's it's something that needs to be tackled. <laughs> um, Alan, in what ways, I mean, I've been in Zurich. I was in the Shed Halle back in the 80s when things were getting started there. The punk scene seems quite, um, you know, relevant and, and potent as a force in uh, occupation um, around the world, if I'm not mistaken, of course, the so-called third world, which we can't really call third world anymore. But um, the punk scene seems to have been quite impactful in that movement. Is that right? And um, in, in the context also of, of cultural activism or artists, what is the interface between, you know, our cultural producers and and uh, occupation? Um, what privileges and insights and tools do artists have that can help leverage or move things forward? As, for example, the real estate show did so effectively. Yeah, I mean, the real estate show in its moment was... Uh was really effective for the people who launched it. But um, we were utterly and completely ineffective in our expressed intention to intervene in the housing situation. The city bought us out. They bought us off like that. So, I mean, I think finally that was great because it's still there. And all those people over all those years, decades, were able to enjoy it and, and use it as a, a liberatory cultural uh, venue. Um, I mean, the, the squatting movement in Europe over the years provided uh, people with free living space or living space for the cost of maintaining the buildings that they lived in and uh, maintaining the social arrangements that they had uh, to hold them. And because they didn't have to work so much, they were able to make culture, make politics. And um, for that reason, they needed to be stopped. Um, <laughs> oh my God, there's the Ezra Pound. <laughs> Look. Yeah, I'm just bop bopping through some of these videos. Um, that's Alan at the uh, revisited real estate show at, at Fuentes a few years ago. Um, so please, please continue, Alan. I apologize. Didn't mean to oh. interrupt. Uh, I sort of lost my, my focus there. Um, no, you were saying how you were bought out right away. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that was fine given, um, you know, the situation that we were in. I mean, it better be fine because it happened. Um, but, you know, when I started to study squatting, I, I realized, um, you know, kind of the bigger picture that our action was part of. Um, and a lot of uh, activists, anarchists in particular in the U.S. over the last several years um, <clears throat> since the uh, Occupy Wall Street days have tried to recapture that um, for themselves to squat buildings, to open buildings, and they have really been brutally repressed continuously. Um, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in, in Seattle, uh, a recent example. Um, yeah, so it, it continues to exist uh, 
as as a really strong meme, and especially with the with the threat of evictions, and um, not I won't say meme as a, as a as a movement impulse, yeah, um, to squat, and uh, it it's really important now I think politically as a, as a threat to government that if you allow mass evictions, there will be squatting. And a revived squatting movement uh, would, in my opinion, be tremendously beneficial for a lot of depressed cities. But you know, that's not the point of view of uh, a government which supports the extraction of rent and the reservoiring of value for families in property ownership. So, Alan, when, when, when Emily and I were recently in Minneapolis, uh, back at the time of your exhibition in, in Milwaukee, we visited for the second time the, um, what I like to call the George Floyd Plaza. Um, right. Yeah, now they're officially calling it um, the George Floyd Square. Um, huh? Plaza seems bigger to me, but I guess they, they're settled for square. You know, that it is an autonomous zone. And um, it is an occupation of a zone, of a neighborhood, of a community space that's physically cordoned off uh, and considered an autonomous space. When you go there now, uh, in case anyone uh, is interested or, or hasn't been there, um, you receive a pamphlet when you walk into the cordon area with um, the sort of um, um, a, a list of demands from the city. Um, I heard recently, isn't it, Emily, that uh, uh, the, the, the fight continues there, that it's still an autonomous zone despite um, police pressure and so forth? Emily shaking her head. Um, so can you speak a little bit, Alan, about that kind of concept and that kind of uh, power? Um, we also visited, um, it was called the... Powder Horn Park in South Minneapolis, where many of those who occupied the streets in South Minneapolis around the George Floyd area, the George Floyd Plaza area, um, became homeless because so many fires were started and, and such. So there was a dedicated movement to permit everyone who was homeless to live in these uh, tent, tent cities or tent villages in the parks. So there's this whole sort of powerful uh, transition or transformation going on in Minneapolis. I don't know what direction it'll go, but that's kind of what it is right now. Can you speak a little bit about autonomous zones and how perhaps that could become a, a, a kind of um, fulcrum? Well, um, no is the short answer to that. <laughs> because okay. I don't live in the US and I haven't participated in any of them. Uh, I mean, I follow uh, Enough 14 and, and It's Going Down and Crime Think uh, and lots of Twitter accounts, uni Ninja Ninja Riot, all of this, Unicorn Ninja Riot, whatever it is, uh, Unicorn Riot. Um, yeah, but I don't, I really don't know. I, there's, there's a network of, of mutual aid uh, that is uh, um, national in the uh, United States. It's actually international. And a lot of, uh, a lot of these are, are uh, strong community activists and anarchists who are involved in that, um, but they haven't networked. Um, they haven't come together uh, as any sort of uh, cohesive political force uh, beyond um, mutual knowledge of each other's existence. Uh, um, and they haven't been repressed like uh, food not bombs in the past and like the Hurricane Sandy uh, mutual aid, uh, which was raided by the police and broken down by the police. Um, you know, the police um, have historically over the last decade or, or more been really bad actors in relation to these, uh, these movements. Um, of mutual aid movements, and they, they kind of are backing off. They're beating up on Black Lives Matter, and they're beating up on pipeline and water defenders. Um, but, you know, it looks like they're not going to be able to do that too much longer um, once the, the I, what I hope is a slow house cleaning of the military police sector uh, uh, proceeding from the Biden Justice Department, the reinstatement of consent decrees, 
uh, which were hammered out uh, under the Obama era that restrained police uh, from racist behavior, which Trump threw away. And I'm, I'm hopeful that Biden is gonna restore. Uh, you know, so I think things will calm down, um, but you know, what happens with all of those networked uh, or not networked mutual aid uh, projects, I, I really don't know. Um, I mean, the anarchist scene has been bubbling like crazy during Trump time. They got really strong and uh, very active and uh, on, on uh, media, mediatically, they're very, they're very uh, present and, and very, it's a very rich scene. You know, I'm, I'm sure that's true on the extreme right too, but I, I don't care to visit. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I remain hopeful. Uh, I don't think that- uh, you, you, you do remain hopeful. And uh, no, I, I, I don't think that this time people are gonna go to sleep like they did when Obama was elected. Well, exactly, there you go. Um, so that, that's, really, uh, that's really important. I mean, it's a whole new generation since um, Obama was elected, you know? And they I, I think that this. your work has exceptionally important popular value. And I would like very much that it might be explored um, how it could enter more into mainstream, Alan. Um, you know, by the way, I just, I think of you as a, a kind of a romantic, uh, perhaps by vocation, somewhat isolated person and lonely figure um, in kind of cultural context. Well, but, hablo muy bien español, entonces. Yeah, exactly. Claro. <laughs> but what, what image or role do you feel you, you were inhabit, inhabiting? In, in the service of community? How do you imagine um, that, you know, your, your work ha can contribute and have some impact? Uh, that's, I, I, I have no idea, to be honest. I just, you know, I'm a addict of social media. I'm a Facebook warrior, I'm a Twitter warrior. Now I'm, throwing things into Mastodon with absolutely no response whatsoever, which is an alternative social media platform. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I never have really cared that much uh, how many people are exposed to my message. Um, I mean, it's kind of what I realized when I was producing the House Magic zine which I did for five or six years. I mean, this was a zine. Uh, I made it on a photocopy machine and I, I sold it for the cost of the reproduction. Um, and, you know, people would say, what are you doing making a zine? You know, uh, like 10 people see it. And uh, that's true, but those 10 people are important and they might actually do something. And my Absolutely zine was right. read by squatters. Right. And you know, domino principle, huh? <laughs> it's it's not how many, it's who. I mean, that's yeah, that's true right. of uh, that's true of of the artwork artwork that we were doing uh, back in the day, and even before that. If you look at photographs of those really important uh, happenings in the 1960s in New York, a lot of the people in the audience are identified, and the audiences are really small. So, but Emily and I hope to. Um invite everyone to perhaps mentor uh, younger generations of people doing the kind of work that, that we, we pioneered. And, um, you know, I say that in the most uh, practical way too, that there will be, you know, an opportunity to have workshops. We're waiting for news of a large grant. Hopefully we'll get it where we can activate some funds in this direction. So um, please, uh, send your prayers toward the Institute. Um, I, I'd like to go, it's now 5.05, so respective of, of our schedule and everyone's sort of expectations, uh, I'm gonna go back through a couple of comments, Alan, and um, from Liz Flintz, was John Hogan who works now uh, on the Soloit Archive part of Colab? John Hogan, anybody know? Doesn't he work at Yale? Um, okay, maybe Liz wants to- You're not thinking to... of John Horgan? Uh, not John Horgan, huh? Uh, is Liz still here? 
Oh, Liz left. Okay. Anyway, uh, you got me because I don't know who, who these people are. Excuse me. Oh, John Hogan was involved with Randolph Street Gallery and uh, he moved to New York and he was involved with Colab. And now I think he works at Yale in uh, the Yale Art Museum. Okay. Well, there, there you go. He also was the painter for, uh, for um, you know, the rabbit guy. <laughs> the rabbit Jeff guy. Coons. He worked for Jeff Koontz. Okay. All right. That's, that's all I know about John Hogan. I haven't seen him in many years. Cool guy. Anyway, folks, please refer to some of these links that people have generously shared in the chat boxes. And um, the, the, it's open, open table now for people to comment or question. And uh, it's so exciting. There's Babette with her hand up in, in Amsterdam at uh, 11.07, I think. Hi, uh, hi, Babette. You have to unmute yourself, OK? Yeah, hi. I, I just wanted to respond a little bit to Alan in terms of, uh, of course, when I came back from San Francisco to live in Amsterdam, uh, you know, squatting was really big here. And, uh, you know, we ourselves had a big artist community in a whole building, which is now an old people's home in the center of Amsterdam. But he probably also knows that now almost everything is gone. And what I was reflecting about was that at that time it was so tangible. It was really clear that we needed spaces to live and artists needed spaces to work. So the squatting movement was, I would say, very well organized here in Amsterdam. Now everything is gone. I mean, there's one or two left. But um, what I found very important is to reflect upon the fact that the major crime happening in cities like these these days is all these is the big finance and capital that are occupying all these huge buildings with uh, offices that are empty and actually making more money for them being empty. And, you know, it's not, people are not working in them, people are not living in them, and this is happening in many major cities. And I wish I could have seen the show that you were all, um, you know, talking about. I have not seen that show, of course. But I want to point to the work of, of Saskia Sassen, who maybe Ellen knows about her. You know, she used to be a professor in Chicago. And um, she works a lot of, you know, she wrote one of the great books about uh, actually the first time that money became virtual, virtual banking and, you know, books about uh, terrorism in a very way that nobody else was writing about it. But anyway, her last work really concerns a lot about the architecture in major cities where major capital is investing and people like my children can hardly live in this city anymore in Amsterdam. You know, everybody, I mean, all the artists, uh, things are being catapulted out of the city. So I just wanted to talk or remind um, Ellen about this that I feel it's so much more complicated now because it's so all virtual. It's not really out there for people to see. Many people don't even know that this exists in cities like ours, you know, where major capital is actually buying up, you know, all these Chinese and foreign people who have these huge capital um, tax shelter things that are being run in these cities. and and that make it unable for other people to live in. I find it very criminal and I find it more difficult to fight it. Like, you know, I mind more difficult than to, than in the time that we were squatting. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, you know? no, it's, a, it's a misery. I, I, I know that ADM was uh, recently evicted. Yeah. So. Um, just, that's not know, even in the center of Amsterdam. That's on the outside. well. It's it's pretty much center, and it's it's where all the you know local artists' activities were moving towards that space. And it's uh, yeah, it's bad, but also the fact that there's no more living spaces for people to live in, and uh, that I would just suggest you check out the work of Saskia Sassen, who is really working on these kind of major capital investments too you know, deprive 
cities of, of living spaces. Um, I just want to introduce you, Babette, to our New York friends, who some of whom you may not know or may not know you. I know that I introduced you and Colleen a few years ago, briefly, I think at the real estate show, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Babette was also a very close student of, of Joseph Boyce. And um, among Babette's social practice work um, is the very considerable um, Buddhist film channel that she created in, in, uh, in Holland that was state sponsored. Um, so, uh, excuse me, Babette, and also Babette will be joining us as a guest, uh, hopefully in a few weeks, closer to uh, Joseph Boyce's 100th uh, birthday anniversary, in, which is in May. So thanks, thanks for your contribution again, Babette. Always Thank you. great to feel you part of this family here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now look at um, Al, uh, uh, Daniel Subkoff, uh, Alan, says um, he spent a good chunk of time in the late 90s uh, up until it was lost to Giuliani, uh, the community activist center squat of an abandoned school in the East Village known as Charis. Uh, yeah. you, or, did you spend time there, Alan, is, is um, Daniel's question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that was an important social center and Giuliani evicted it specifically to break the uh, community organizing that was happening there. Um, and it's a scandal that uh, uh, de Blasio has not uh, um, reclaimed it with city, with city funds and uh, reopened it as a community center. Um, there's a similar um, school, abandoned school or vacant school in East Harlem that's been completely uh, redeveloped. Uh, PS 109 with artist housing and community center in the lower floors and Chara should be that should have been that for years now. So yeah, that's a horrible situation. Um, it was squatted only for a very short time. Uh, that was all kind of arranged. Then they had a permission to use. Um, <laughs> so yeah. I want to mention that Alan Todd uh, in Lisbon today um, He's, he's French and, and is living in Lisbon, was one of our guests back in the beginning of October. And Alan has figured out kind of a legal way of squatting and preserving forests um, through legal means that were established uh, 200 years ago. Um, Alan is wonderful and he's here. I hope he's still around. There he is. Alan, would you like to say something, Alan, about your... Uh, uh, no, but uh, 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 um, uh, um, it was make, it make me think that now everybody's super aware that the squatting can help um, uh, the business of uh, renting business and uh, and it's uh, uh, it's almost institutionalized as it is the case in Saint Denis Island in the north of Paris, where where the Cis Bay I I, I I share the link. This place was really squatted uh, uh, like five years or no, maybe 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 more like ten years ago, and uh, and uh, and it became it became really now an institution with an association with uh, uh, all the thing organized, and the purpose of it is to make the neighborhood fancy, and so and so the the, the owner let one buildings being squatted to sell what is around. Uh, and to build new bu fancy building to make uh, Saint Denis Island a little bit more fancy, and it's the same what is happening here in in Lisbon, because we have seen so many friend and group uh, in have been in the neighborhood where the people were squatting a lot, and it's time there is an abandoned house people are squatting it. Um, <clears throat> it's not only artists; it's also. Um, uh, normal student, normal people of the, not only people who need art, art space, also families who just need a house. There is a big communist community in Angers in Lisbon who is um, always trying to help those families and squatting uh, apartments. This, it happened during the pandemic, the, la the, lex, the last lockdown in March last year in 2020, and they were like fight with police, and um, and uh, and they were expulsed by it. So it's true that uh, 
it's very specific for artists because artists they can create a value on the building and uh, <laughs> and this is all related to a convention that is the Bern Convention 1886 and I think this Bern Convention can really be used for other purpose in many many areas. It's okay, like Alan, Alan, let me direct you for a moment if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry. Please, oh, no, like, no, please, yeah, please. yeah, yeah, yeah. You do what to interrupt me, <laughs> like, Alan. You, yeah. you know what an elevator pitch is? An what? elevator pitch? Elevator pitch. No. Okay. In two minutes, tell us. Oh, oh right. Yeah. <laughs> where, where is he? Hollywood oh, lingo. Alan, just give us the sort of um, thumbnail, a brief description of your, your forest preservation uh, art, you know, forest as art um, concept. Just two or three lines. Okay, basically, uh, like a ready-made uh, sculpture, I, I propose to owner who have a forest to make their forest uh, a sculpture. So I'm selling to the owner a sculpture that is made of forest. And then once the forest is becoming a sculpture, the forest is, is protected by the, con the Bern Convention 1886. The Bern it's becoming Convention a work of art, part of the patrimony. Oh, uh, patrimony. Okay, so that's a real thing, and your PhD is, you know, in the process. And um, Emily and I were very happy to write you a letter of recommendation from yeah, thank the you. institute. The institute. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to keep yeah, candidating for for money, actually, that for grant and for for support, and that is why I, I'm, I think using letters could be nice. <laughs> okay. Um, so so I'm um, sorry. I just want to ask you. Uh, it, so by, through the burn convention, then that forest is protected in perpetuity. Like once the owner passes away, let's say it falls out of their ownership, but because it was sold as an artwork, it's then grandfathered in in perpetuity as protected under the exactly. IP of, of the artist. Is that correct? correct. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> it's no longer a forest. It's becoming a work of art, actually. <laughs> and also the bee pollen and the... Um... And the moss, right? And the ginseng, everything yeah. there. It's bio art. The air. Yeah, it's bio art. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, everything is art since since the body body is art. So we are reaching a point that everything everything is art as much as we as we figure it like it. So maybe a building, maybe maybe a space. Uh, can be art um, as far as it is. Uh, for instance, there is a very nice example of street art of a guy who was drawing Le Chat, a cat, everywhere in Paris. And he was like, a, it's like an orange cat. And uh, it was prosecuted by, by the, 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 the French government, the, 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 the justice, because he was destroying the, the buildings. And, uh, and then after he became famous and he became a kind of, uh, uh, he can be, he start to be sold in galleries. And so he was acquitted. He didn't have to pay all the trials that was against him. He was acquitted and, uh, and now the building he painted have more value. Exactly like what happened with uh, the, the one everybody knows, uh, Banksy. Banksy is doing something totally illegal. And because of art is making something powerful like he paints a wall illegally and then the wall is more valuable than it was before let's remember also that the the fluxus uh, you know george machunas um was the oh. john froze okay, we, we lost john ah uh, okay it's not me only Oh, mother, can you hear me? Came back. Okay. The reference was um, George Machunas, who pioneered uh, the artist AIR spaces in Soho in New York, and you know, following suit, um, as we've been discussing, the artists are sort of the uh, fertilizers um, for the capitalists to come in. And um, and by the way, he was beat up by the uh, FBI. Um, you know, because he was, you know, becoming kind of successful there. Yeah. Or it was the mafia that beat him up, but he had three, 
Well, anyway, George Machunas is an interesting figure in this conversation too. So anyway, we're, we have about, you know, 10 more minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, Didi, please, please go ahead. Yeah, I just, I was showing a bit of my archive, which I'm also trying to figure out what to do with and how to make it available. I, <clears throat> I urge people to pay their domain fees because I recently lost my own name <laughs> website. And, uh, yep. You have to, uh, you have to buy it back, which is, somebody bought it and uh, yeah. I will be $10,000 to get it back. Just my yeah. name name. Anyway, but I also um, wanted to say in terms of Zurich, I have an amazing video called Zutgeil. Do you know about that? Which was about the police takeover of a squat in, in Zurich, uh, a squat that where people were uh, clean, providing clean needles for the junkies in the park and all kinds of uh, food not bombs kind of thing. And uh, it's an amazing tape. And that to me, I don't know how many people in the world have that tape, but I have a good copy of it if anybody is interested in that. And, um, and I wanted just to say that um, Sasia Sassen is now at Columbia. You can reach her through, through Googling her at Columbia and um, and my, my, this book tells uh, that I was mentioning before, Contested Institutions or whatever it is. Uh, it's, a, it's called, yeah, Counter Institution. And it has a very wonderful piece about Chadas that somebody mentioned. There's a, a long chapter about Chadas in the book and also about the War Resisters League building uh, which uh, in part of their discussion of how important it is to have spaces. And, and I think that's a really inspirational idea to try to promote the space. <laughs> Here's Chadis. I don't know if you can see that picture. Chico, a bunch of the old guys. Anyway, the great, great space. Um, can we can we digitize your that film that the, the Zurich story? Sure. Is it, where is where? where I I'm trying to digitize as much as I can. It's just uh, it's also finding a space to host it and to keep it keep all that stuff and not have to pay all that rent to uh, <laughs> to Google. The uh, archive.org has a lot of my stuff, but I haven't put Zootgeil up there yet. Dee Dee, Emily and I would be happy. Frozen again. I guess both of you guys are frozen. <laughs> It's it's curious when I when I spoke with John earlier about this, he said uh, he was thinking about inviting Colab to this talk, and and, and in the end he just invited me. So <laughs> I well, wonder I wondered how that might work. Um, are we back? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're gonna go through the Colab roster one by one, <laughs> and. Um, because we have to book shows up here for 2021. Let's face it, guys. So, you know, but it would be lovely to have a panel conversation, perhaps very specific conversation uh, with, with Collab. Um, maybe, you know, zeroing in on real estate show and the Times Square show um, with, with some real depth and imagery. Um, yeah. And again, we, yeah, Emily Harris. Are we getting yourself. feedback? Um, only okay. when you're speaking. Okay. I just wanted to throw in that there was uh, in Oakland, California, a, a squat that was actually successful where a family, I think it was pretty dirty, but did you guys hear about that maybe a year ago? 
Yeah, there, there have been many successful squats in the USA, uh, but the information is not widely known. Um, yeah, I mean, Hannah Dobbs' book, uh, Nine Tenths of the Law, uh, kind of surveys US squatting. She's kind of dropped out off the scene as a, as a researcher, but that's an important book. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I haven't followed really uh, um, squatting in the US. Uh, this one was just a year ago and um, the whole community came out and defended that this home would go to one specific family and there were police uh, with yeah, 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 riot yeah. gear, people came out, um, but that was, I don't know, I don't know of, of um, recent squats that have been successful like that. Yeah, that Brent was an eviction. Jordan defense. made a very good film about that that was used uh, to enable them to keep the SWAT. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, you know, a lot of rent strike organizing, anti-eviction organizing that's, that's happening across the country, um, which is uh, one of the reasons why I think uh, Biden is going to extend the uh, anti-eviction orders to avoid the mobilization of that movement, which gears up every time it looks like uh, there might be a wave of evictions. But I must admit, sorry to just put in my little pennies worth, but in Paris from where I am, I would agree a little bit with Alan Todd that there is a tendency to, well, the artists have to fight their two major squads, he may know them, one in the 13th, Le Frigo, and the other one in Rue de Rivoli in the center near Châtelet Léal. And Rue de Rivoli, I mean, for years, I mean, this has been going since the 90s, it's been going. And it's been kind of institutionalized. The artists managed to fight to not be evicted. It's really street art outside and everything. And there's one space, the artists are still living there. And there's one space which is which has street view. It's on street level. And there are concerts on Saturdays at 6 p.m., which means people can also visit the squat and kind of buy art. But it's like a, an attraction venue in the heart of the city. And in Les Frigo, Les Frigo with the old fridges where meat used to be kept. And I think even where people were, you know, um, for a while kept before they were kind of transported, exported to some of the concentration camps. I mean, it's really a kind of a, but it's such an extraordinary looking like old red brick castle, but which just in, in the heart of Paris on the banks of the river. And totally, not only artists, but also craftspeople and everything occupied all the spaces there. And there was just no way they put up, you know, they put up signs to say who they were, the work they did and everything, what each person was. And there was no way they were going to let go. And, and the city, they, there was a long, long, long fight. And, and the city finally gave in. And I mean, they've got restaurant spaces there. They've got under the vaults or under the under the they've got um like archers under the street level and all of those they are concerts and they've created spaces where there's restaurants and again exactly like alan said they've been turned into trendy areas finally of paris that attract people that raise the prices and so on because of these vibrant vibrant you know places where the artists are and um it, it's um, they've been, it's not the past, it's the present, they're big battles and there's not much communal, I mean, living, but I mean, there are big artist areas because the, 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 the cities have dedicated um, low cost housing also to artists. That's different. It's not squats. It's not really squats, but squatting, which are not artists, that goes on all the time because there are laws in Paris whereby you can't evict people as soon as winter begins. So as soon as an empty place is heard of people go into it. But it's not the same as artist squats that really make a huge difference and become, you know, major venues. So the, this is still part of the present. I don't know about Berlin, but I think Berlin made a huge, huge inroads into the way people could live in East Berlin compared to, you know, I think so. So I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to hear the past and, 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 
you know, the movements you're talking about. And I don't know, it makes me wonder if any archiving is being done in Paris about these places. But, um, you know, it's certainly ongoing battles by artists that, is, that are progressively won. But when there's a possibility for the city to turn it into something to their advantage, I think, exactly as Alan described about 6B in um, Saint-Denis. You know. Mr. Vera, if, if, um, who in Paris would care to you know, document, archive, journalize, uh, scholasticize what's happening in Paris? Who, if anyone, who would care to, to be doing that? I'm curious. Well, you see, I never ever thought about it until tonight's conversation. I have no idea. I I didn't think about it. But, you know, we've got, for example, even in our area, old schools that are converted into spaces for sort of mini biennales and stuff, but people don't live in them. They just become places that can be occupied by artists for festivals or for exhibitions for installations, you know, but it's not living space. But they, the artists are always militating for any uninhabited spaces to, to be able to occupy them for something. So we've got artist studios, we've got printing presses, that sort of stuff, but not people living there. But any abandoned buildings are, are, are immediately, immediately kind of looked upon as places where artists can, can occupy and and do something but any archiving that's going on i have absolutely no idea if anybody thinks about it from that point of view or has even thought of it so it would be the art schools maybe people in art schools who or architecture yeah i mean no, i have no idea absolutely no idea and what maybe about, what about in johannesburg, johannesburg Bureau? what's going on any idea? oh my god that is major that is different altogether because Johannesburg, if I think about downtown Maboneng, which is where used to be, I mean, the whole of, um, you know, these, these, I mean, buildings that had been um, office buildings, lawyers building, dentists, medical, whatever, were all abandoned and taken over progressively um, by artists and young entrepreneurs who invented and converted parking lots um uh, all kinds of areas downtown into places as, that artists could rent as studios but also as galleries so that like a sunday i mean the artists will live there but sunday it's galleries there's neighbor neighbor goods markets people bring in food all kinds of things are happening but all sorts of artists and craft people it can be coffee makers it can be people who who also make clothing. So in fact, it's true that the artists have taken over downtown in areas where people are living also under in terrible conditions, but, but, uh, and, and totally dilap dilapidated and completely um, buildings that have collapsed from not being maintained. The entrepreneurs are buying them up and they are transforming them. And these areas are becoming the trendiest areas of Johannesburg. So, I mean, this is also true that the artists are leading the change. They're leading the changes downtown, but the, the, you've got entrepreneurs investing and then the artists are going in. And the major artists like William Kentridge, I don't have to introduce him to you. He was a school friend of mine and a university friend and we still are friends and he's all over the world. But he's got, and he's got exhibitions in France, Luxembourg, wherever you think you know that, you know that, I don't have to tell you. Yeah, no, but he's one of the people who's also got a studio in Maboneng, downtown Johannesburg. And not only, is he, not only is it a studio, he's also created a space, which a workshop space called the Center for the Less Good Idea where he's doing theater work and he's actually doing the most extraordinary amount of bringing culture into a place where people can improvise and do things um, with whatever's around and even the long minute for people who are just amazing things in the space, uh, which is being seen as um, space for everybody. So, so, 
you know, it is. That's, that's, is that one, is it, William Kentridge, is it on his website? Is some, how, how can we find yeah, out? You that? can find the Center for the Less Good Idea. And you can, and, and in fact, on Facebook and Facebook Live, you can find the Center for the Less Good Idea because people are, cons are putting up things like the long minute. It's all kinds of people are going in and there's, there's been dance improvisation with cups and saucers, there's just with found objects with buckets and spades, but incredibly political and really interesting stuff from nothing, you know. But this is from Grotowski Theatre Days. He's a theatre person. And he's been able, with his knowledge and his his know-how, to turn this into a high culture place, as if he's just playing like a jester, like a court jester. Yeah, he's just extraordinary. But yeah, this is. Um, I, I wasn't. I forget about that. But that's how Johannesburg has been transformed, is through the artists and the arts. Uh, Vera, do you mind just? Um, you're an artist and a scholastic. Do you mind saying something about uh, what you've been doing, who you are? <laughs> well, um, maybe I'll just say that what I'm in the middle of doing, it'll be easier because I'm a, I am um, an academic and I work in a field which is not in the arts. But at the moment, I am very actively involved in, in um, embodied practices online with artists from all over Europe, where we are co-creating and also creating workshops for students to be less isolated. So that's one thing we're doing. But another thing that um, I'm also doing is I'm involved in um, having to give a quite important talk to, to scientists and others about the role of chance in art anyway. And of course, we all know that it plays a role, but in different with different artists. I'm going to be working on Henri Michaud and William Kentridge. And Henri Michaud is a French Franco-Belgian dual artist. Maybe you know of him. City Lights published on him. Alan Todd would know him, perhaps. Probably. Maybe you do. And um, I was fortunate enough to meet him. I came to France in order to meet him and to work with him. And uh, his work, his, his, that was 40 years ago, but his work inspired everything I do. So whether I work in that field or not is totally irrelevant. I did my PhD on his work. It led to no job. I didn't care at all. That was not the point. But it, it completely informs meaning in everything that I do, you know. And, and it's not at all, there's no, there's no clash with my Buddhist studies. There's no clash with my teaching. There's no clash with anything I do. It's just underlying extraordinary um, dedication to what's essential about art and the transformative power of art. And I so believe in that, that um, anything I engage in, including something like tonight, <laughs> is just for its transformative power. You know, because I know I won't be the same after, and I know I'll be behind in my old work and stuff, but I'll catch up. But I know that that these moments are just important in themselves, you know? Thank and you, meeting Mary. people like you, hearing you, seeing where it leads my thoughts and connecting with John and his, you know, network, his precious network. <laughs> Thanks, thanks so much, Vera. It's really great that you're here again. So um, we're at 5.40 now. We're uh, you know, officially uh, nine minutes over time. Um, but people are welcome to say good night or good luck. Um, Emily usually sings a song for us. No, not tonight. <laughs> All my time is 10 minutes over time. It's always like that. It's the only time I've got. <laughs> so. Things happen at the last minute. So. <gasps> Thank you, Vera. Babette, are you saying something? Oh, I'm just saying goodbye, ladies. Ladies, okay. good night. Uh -huh. It's been a wonderful night. Hey, John. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> I have to bye. Take bye. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Bye, Alan. Bye bye. 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 Good night. Thanks,
Good night. Good night. Bonne nuit. Bonne nuit. Bonne nuit. <rire> Bonne nuit. <rire> Bonne nuit.